1309. After a 17-year reign, Radin Wijaya, the man that founded the kingdom of Majapahit, dies. His kingdom passes to his son, along with his troubles. Before his death, Radin Wijaya had devoted most of his reign to diplomacy, attempting to sustain his father-in-law's network of vassal states. But instead of relying on military force like his father-in-law, Wijaya's primary tool was marriage. Unlike the Christian kings of Europe, Hindu Buddhist monarchs like Wijaya could marry many times to reinforce their web of alliances. But that actually made things more complicated, if you can believe that. Having many wives meant keeping a delicate balance of which wife had the highest status, lest he offend one of his many, many family members slash political allies. Marriage is already hard, and it gets even harder when you have half a dozen wives and your in-laws all have armies. And unfortunately, Wijaya broke the cardinal rule of polygamous marriage alliances. He promoted a consort to the position of primary wife over the heads of other higher status wives and named their youngest son, Jaya Nagara, as his successor. Worse than that, it was a Sumatran princess, meaning their heir would not be fully Javanese. In the Indonesian archipelago, where water separated Majapahit from its vassal states and mountains naturally divided islands into fiefdoms, it was always tempting for local lords to declare independence. And now, with Wijaya's insult, they had a reason. Wijaya spent the rest of his reign putting down rebellions, and left his son a kingdom that was, essentially, primed to revolt against this partially foreign heir. So when Jaya Nagara ascended the throne, he tried to emphasize Majapahit's strength and his lineage. He took a royal name, we're ignoring those for simplicity by the way, that emphasized Majapahit's spiritual ties to India. He buried his father and grandfather in imposing funerary temples dedicated to Shiva. And five years into his reign, he crushed his first rebellion. But here's the thing about Jayanagara. He was really good at some aspects of kingship. He was handsome, charming, and had a talent for throwing big drunken parties. He was good at building monuments. And most of all, he was good at bringing the prettiest women in Majapahet to marry him and serve as attendants. And you know, all that stuff is part of Javanese kingship. It was important to overawe people with splendor and wealth, and he had that part of the job on lockdown. It was all the other stuff he wasn't so great at. You know, stuff like ruling, politics, diplomacy, war. We don't have a lot of stories where he excels here, or really any stories about him doing much of anything. Sure, he put down his first rebellion, but we don't even know whether he was personally involved or not. So 10 years into his reign, when yet another rebellion forced him to flee from the capital, it looked like Majapahit's time was up. The king was on the run with only 25 royal bodyguards, his power broken. At camp that night, he saw whispers passing between the guards. Why should we continue to protect this weak king? Are we to die for him? Could we not just turn him over? Their loyalty was beginning to curdle. Just then, the captain of the guards stepped in. This was a man who inspired tremendous respect and confidence among his men, something Jayanagara never managed. In fact, this man was so mighty that his name literally meant Elephant General. With a few words, the captain crushed the mutterings, and the next morning he brought the king to a remote village to hide in exile. This was the first action of a man who defined the kingdom of Majapahit. A man who will become so associated with Javanese power politics that even in the 20th century, politicians would model themselves after him. Gaja Mata, the Elephant General. And Gaja Mata refused to let the dynasty fall. Leaving the king with trusted officers, he returned to the capital. He filtered through the market, gauging the mood of the populace. Afterward, he entered the palace and mixed with the would-be revolutionaries. He spread rumors that the king was dead. The lineage of Wijaya snuffed out. And each time he told the story, he gauged the reaction from his audience. He remembered who grieved and who celebrated. Those that celebrated were the first ones Mata executed when his counter-revolutionaries regained the capital. 
With just 25 men at his command and no resources to speak of, Gajamada had rallied the people and reinstalled a monarch. And that's when Jayanagara discovered something else he was good at, delegating. In thanks for his service, he promoted Mata to a high office in court, and things started evening out. Mata dealt with the periodic rebellions and took on more and more of the duties of state. Under his leadership, Majapahit negotiated two new trade agreements with China, the biggest accomplishment of Jayanagara's reign. But delegating away responsibilities gave Jayanagara something that wasn't good for him. Free time. Released from most duties, he could indulge his taste for leisure and vice. He soon gained an evil reputation. Part of it stemmed from how he treated his family. He reportedly locked his half-sisters in a palace, refusing to let them wed lest their husbands become usurpers. An act that became increasingly unseemly once they reached marriageable age. And then there was the king's private life. Now, in Java, kings were frequently mobile. The court would travel the countryside, extracting taxes and tributes from villages they passed through. And if on one of those journeys, the king saw a beautiful woman, he might order her to become one of his attendants or wives. As horrifying as this appears to us today, after all, this meant kings were literally extracting human beings as tribute in the same way they extracted rice or Chinese coin. It was an accepted part of rule in Java. What the king wanted, the king received. But Jayanagara took this power to an unprecedented extreme. He was uninterested in village girls. He was interested, however, in his stepsisters, in the wives of his court officials, in their daughters. And in a decision that almost without a doubt will go down as the single worst idea we've covered in this entire show, the wife of his surgeon. Not his former surgeon, mind you, his current surgeon right before he was supposed to have an operation. That operation, suffice to say, did not go as planned. Luckily, Gajamada was standing nearby, supervising the proceedings, and the moment he saw the knife plunge into the king's body, he drew his kris and slew the affronted surgeon. But the deed had been done. His king, the king he had saved, the man he put back on the throne, was dead. Jayanagara had no legitimate heir. So the kingdom passed to the daughter of the last king of Singhasari. But because she had taken holy orders, her daughter, Princess Gitarja, was crowned queen. It was a fortunate thing for Gajamada, since he had mentored the princess all her life. And when she took the throne, she named Mata, Majapahit's most loyal servant and the king's defender, Prime Minister. They erected a tall gate to settle the dead king's spirit and moved on. And if that sounds too convenient, well, there's the rub. See, it wasn't just the surgeon's family that Jayanagara had violated. He'd also dishonored Gaja Mata's wife. And one story has it that Gaja Mata was actually the one that put the surgeon up to the assassination, meaning his timely intervention may have actually been a cover-up. And interestingly, one of the only records of that period is a hagiography that was written right after Gaja Mata held power meaning that the whole story about Jayanagara's lechery may have been after-the-fact justification for what was essentially a coup. Either way, this incident was pure Gajamada, cunning, ruthless, manipulative, and ferociously pragmatic. A Yago of the First Order. Trust me, keep your eye on this guy. Gajamada is what you'd get if Machiavelli wrote fan fiction. And that kind of political maneuvering would typify Gajamada's reign. Because while monarchs came and went, for the next 30 years, this prime minister would steer the ship of state towards empire. Not long after his ascension to prime minister, Mata made a vow. He would not taste spice until all of Nusantara, the Indonesian islands, were under Majapahit's control. Exactly what he meant by tasting spice is unclear. It probably meant engaging in religious rituals, but he meant it. Over the next several decades, Gajamada would go on the offensive, expanding Majapahit power to the Spice Islands in the east and up through Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula. And exactly what form this expansion took and exactly how much these kingdoms were really vassals is up for debate. 
but most of them probably came to Majapahit's orbit via diplomacy, bribes, and tributary relationships rather than outright military conflicts. In other places, though, like Bali, Mata would prosecute a decade-long war, trying to bring the island under Majapahit's control. And as the regency passed, and the new king came of age, Gajamata's project neared completion. Majapahit was poised for a golden age, the age of a new king, Hayam Waruk, whose reign would change Indonesian culture forever.